Lord, as we come to your word, we do come with a humble heart. Lord, we absolutely know the tendency of our natural man to be deceived. And we also know the cunningness of the enemy to deceive us. Uh, Lord, you said in the last days, take heed that no one deceive you. So, Lord, I pray that you will come by your Holy Spirit and illuminate the truth to us so that it can be clear in our mind and heart uh, where we stand with you and how you want us to walk, uh, especially as a fellowship, but also individually. So we just commit this time to you in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. So we are going to read parts of Acts chapter 4. We'll be, I'll, I'm going to pick out a few things from Acts chapter 4, but the part that we will read through is Acts chapter 4, verse 13 to 37. So Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 13 to 37. 13 to 37. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the men who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them from, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you uh, more than to God you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which have, sorry, what, what happens is I'm reading, all these thoughts keep popping into my head about what it's saying and I'm trying to keep reading the text. So. <laughs> For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done, for the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them, so when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your pur purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and bought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joses, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, I know there's a lot in there and I'm skipping over sections of Acts. Remember how I asked you ages ago, read through Acts, try and listen to it or read through it in one setting. I would encourage you to probably do that a few times. That way the bits and pieces I leave out, you'll be aware of. But I just want to highlight a few things in this chapter. Now, we know that this is where Peter and John went up into the temple and they said to the lame man who was at the gate, gold and silver have I none in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And um, they healed him. But in verse 
Acts chapter 4, verse 2 to 4, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So they preached Jesus and the resurrection from the dead, and about 5,000 men came to saving faith. Now, one of the things to understand about the context and the Jews being so disturbed about this is that the Jews are under Roman rule. Now, when the Romans occupy an area, they allow the, any existing religion in that area to continue so long as that religion will in no way compete with the Roman rule or that the emperor is God. So a lot of religions that exist can continue. Now, they fully understood that if this sect, and it's not really a sect. In their mind, Christianity is a new religion, which means they understood that if Christianity takes off and becomes a new religion, that the Romans are going to come down and they're not going to distinguish between Jews who are part of the new religion and Jews who are part of the old religion. They will just um, threaten them, you know, and push into their homes, crucify them. They'll do whatever they need to to stamp out this religion, because you're not allowed to create a new religion under Roman rule. So it wasn't just their religious blindness to Jesus Christ as the Messiah. It was also their fear of losing their position and losing their power or losing the capacity to be able to continue as Jews under Roman rule. Acts chapter 4, verse 10 to 11. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. I just love this, the change in these guys from when he was so scared. Every time I read through Acts, this always happens to me. I see him when he was so scared that he couldn't even talk to a servant girl who was just attending to the fire at the door of the high priest. It was nobody. She had no influence over anybody. And he couldn't say, yes, I'm one of them. Keep it quiet. He couldn't even say that. He denied Christ to the servant girl. And now he's standing up in front of the people who crucified him again because he did that also, uh, as we know, on the day of Pentecost. Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him this man stands here before you whole. Now the point here is to always understand with the significant supernatural miracles that the apostles are performing is because they are testifying to the resurrection of the dead. Now you have to try and understand what this means. They're not just bringing in a new religion. They're not just bringing in a new philosophy. You know, we have this new philosophy. You know, let us, let us educate you on the new philosophy. No, what they are talking about is the resurrection from the dead, and in particular that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now, if you came to me and you were to say, I'm going to start a new religion, and, you know, r- rising from the dead is something we haven't seen, haven't heard, no one's done that, ne- never sort of heard of in human history. You come to me and say, our religion is based on the resurrection from the dead. Oh, okay. Nowadays, we have a place we send people like that. (laughs) But then if you started doing miracles left, right and centre, if you started walking on water, if you started commanding the weather, if you started multiplying food, if you raised somebody who'd been dead for four days, Lazarus, all of a sudden I'm going to go, hold on a minute, there might be something to this. Now, because the apostles were now testifying to the resurrection from the dead, God because it's not like us. You see, you've got to understand the context is different. They don't have the Bible, the New Testament that's sitting on your lap. They have the Old Testament. And now there's this, which is the Jews. And they're saying the Jews and the temple and everything. And out of that, they can explain to people the prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ, about the Messiah, that Jesus is that chief cornerstone and the foundation of the prophets, right? So they can explain it. But the average Christian doesn't have the New Testament. So what's the average Christian relying upon? The apostle to come and tell. Like I, if I was like back in that time an apostle, I'd be coming and telling you, you don't have a notepad in front of you. You don't have a Bible in front of you. I'm going to come and tell you about the resurrected Jesus Christ. And you're going to say to me, why should we leave Judaism? Why should we leave something that we know God gave the Jews and follow this? Well, then I'm going to perform miracles like Jesus performed miracles, so that you'll know that the message that I'm bringing is the same message that Jesus Christ brought and that I am one of his apostles or sent one 
or disciples. So I'm going to demonstrate this to you, which is what they did. They raised this man from the dead. Now, we know that many other miracles were performed by them. This is only one that's going to be written about because it had significant consequences, which we're going to look at. But when he was accusing them about you crucified in verse 11, so Acts 4, 11, this is the stone, he's talking about Jesus, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders. So in other words, a new, a new religion, a new extension of the old into the new, Jesus Christ, because he rose from the dead, you rejected him, which has become the chief cornerstone. So the very one that they rejected as a false prophet, as somebody who was to be put to death so that the Romans wouldn't come in and destroy Judaism, that person that you have rejected as the builders, he has become now the chief cornerstone, which means now the church is built from and on this cornerstone, Jesus Christ. But what aspect to it? That he died, was buried and rose again. This is what the apostles testified to, that he rose from the dead. And everything else then in terms of the teaching and understanding extends out from this understanding that Jesus, God, has power over life and death and that Jesus was risen from the dead by the power of the Father. Acts chapter 4 verse 31, when they had prayed and the place where they assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So one of the evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit is to be able to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, these people in this Acts 4.3, the people here had already been filled at the day of Pentecost and were now filled again, adding weight to the teaching that the filling of the Holy Spirit is not a static event in your history, but an ongoing reality as needed. Now, they needed it. They were being threatened not to talk about Jesus. They were concerned about the change in the attitude and they were afraid and concerned. What are we going to do? But they prayed and then God filled them, it says in the text, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. How can you be filled with the Holy Spirit if you've already been filled with the Holy Spirit? This is where, remember, our, the transition from Greek into English loses it because it says don't be drunk with wine but B, being continually filled with the Holy Spirit because the tense for being filled with the Holy Spirit is present continuous, which means you're not relying upon your capacity to be bold, your capacity to share the gospel is not being sort of relied upon on something I experienced with the Holy Spirit 30 years ago. What it's being relied upon is my current filling of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, if you're lacking the capacity to be bold about the preaching of the gospel, you need to be filled afresh because there's a fresh filling, a fresh work of the Holy Spirit. You can't just rely upon what happened to you decades ago. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. So they saw the boldness of these men and that is one of the things that will strike people about you when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, your capacity to be bold about your faith, uh, your capacity to just be bold in the face of a world that is secular, unbelieving, believing in natural science and evolution. And you say, I believe a God who created, I believe a God who came in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And I believe that all men have sinned and need a saviour and that saviour is Jesus Christ and you stand firm and speak boldly, it's not just what you say. People see the conviction of your heart. Do you really believe that to be true? And if you do really believe that to be true, you, all, you know, with the power of the Holy Spirit, you can declare it, and sometimes it's the, your faith, your boldness that can have an impact on people. That guy actually believes what he's talking about. Now, when it says they were uneducated and untrained men, they're not uneducated as in illiterate. They wrote letters, they wrote revelation and different things, Peter, John. So they're not uneducated in that sense. What it's saying here is they were uneducated in the scribes and Pharisees. In other words, they hadn't been through the, through the education system of the rabbi school to, because they're saying things that rabbis shouldn't be saying. If, what, the, what they're perceiving is, hold on, stop, what you're saying is not what we say, you haven't been through our school. 
So therefore, if you're not saying what we think you should be saying, stop that, come to our school, we'll educate you on what's right. But then they realised, hold on a minute, these men have been with Jesus. So when you think about Peter and John, uh, now they had boldness because of the Holy Spirit baptism. They were uneducated and untrained from the perspective of the rabbi school with the Jews, but their training consisted of three years with God incarnate. So their understanding of truth far exceeds those who have been through the rabbi school. Now, this miracle was one of many performed by the apostles. It's only one given. We're going to just quickly look at a few. Maybe just note this down. Acts 2, 43. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. We've talked about that before. These signs and wonders that the apostles are doing are so significant that it causes fear amongst believers. Acts chapter 4, verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. With great power. Not meaning great eloquence of speech like a, like a good TED talk. They're talking about miraculous power. And great grace was upon them all. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. So it's clear in the early writings in Acts that the writer, which is most likely Luke, is recording that there is a significant difference between what the apostles are doing and the, by now, where we're up to at least probably 15, 20,000 Christians by this stage. So they're making a distinction. It's not 15,000, 20,000 Christians running off doing these miracles. It is the apostles who are still doing these miracles. And there's a reason for it. The reason I've already given you, but make sure you understand it. The people who have come to the Lord now need to be taught by the apostles. The apostles have been taught by the Lord Jesus for three years. So he can now manifest the miraculous power through them because they're going to testify of what the Lord Jesus taught them. So the miracles then become a stamp of authority and power upon the apostles to say, listen to our doctrine. We were with the Lord Jesus Christ. The thousands of Christians that exist by now, if they were doing, imagine if they would have the same miracle working power, the massive confusion, because we don't have the Bible, the New Testament at this stage. So you go to Joe Blow and he says, oh, yes, the word is a mirage of reality and that Jesus was just a mist of the imagination of your mind and he wasn't real and let me raise somebody from the dead. There you go. And now hold on, that's not what the apostles said. Right, So therefore, God is not doing miracles through average Christians because he's doing it through the apostles to confirm the teaching. Now, that has significant implications for us after miracles today because quite often when we chase a miracle, we want relief from suffering. We want our life to be a little bit more comfortable, a little bit easier. Lord, could I trip over a gold nugget down the back and buy that Sea Wind 1160? Uh, oh, sorry, tongue in cheek, because there are people who are actually in real suffering who actually do need a real miracle. And you think, see, our motive then coming to the miracle is I want relief from suffering. But when you look at this, the purpose of the miracle wasn't to relieve the lame man from his suffering. And that's why it's written down and recorded in such detail. The purpose of the miracle was that Peter could preach and explain to them, we are the apostles, we are the ones who have been with Jesus. And now this miracle confirms that we have been with Jesus and now listen to what we are saying. Now, the author of Acts, most likely Luke, was inspired to record this particular healing because it had significant consequences. Remember, there are many other miracles they performed. He could have picked on any miracle that they performed. So don't think this is just a one-off. No, this is one of many. So this, this is why it's significant. The supposed favour with the people changed at this point. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it says, praising God and having favour with all the people. Remember how I brought that up last time? Favour with what people? So this is early. This is Pentecost. You know, they've come to believe. They've now got a good group of people, a few thousand. Uh, they're eating bread from house to house, simplicity of heart, having favour with the people. Now, who is, I said last time, who favour with what people? I think at this stage they had favour with the people in their community, like the culture, the town. And as I said last time, that's not going to last very long. And sometimes you might still become converted or a church might preach the gospel and for a period of time have favour. But once, once the gospel gets moving, 
And once the truth of the message starts to be understood, that favor quickly changes. So this miracle has shifted the favor of the people. Uh, It also led to an undeniable acceptance that God was with them. A notable miracle has been done by these guys. We can't deny it. Even the, uh, those who are opposing it were saying, we can't deny this notable miracle. We have a problem. This led to divine support for their teaching. And I mean divine, as in God's support for their teaching. So be careful if you want a miracle you, uh, or to be a miracle worker or the gift of miracles, because remember, this is what confuses people. I'm talking about the miracle working power of the apostles. There is the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, and the gift of faith. We're going to deal with that down the track. But this level where it causes fear in people, fear in the believers, is a level that says God's stamp of approval. Why? To be a miracle working apostle? No, because of the message, the resurrection from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it led to divine support. It also empowered the simple gospel message that they now preached. It led to their imprisonment for at least overnight, and preaching in Jesus' name was now forbidden by them. So things are changing. Now, if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2 to 6, 1 Corinthians 2, 2 to 6. This will add a bit of weight to what I'm saying about the miracle working power of the apostles to confirm the message, understanding that they didn't have the New Testament. So you've got to, for those who believe that this level of uh, apostleship in terms of miracle working power should still be for today, then you've got to answer, that person has to answer the question, well, we have the New Testament. So we have the recording of the teachings of Jesus and the doctrine of the apostles in the, in the New Testament, our Bible. So if, a, if a, anyone is performing miracles to this level, coming out with a teaching, and it's a new teaching or different than how we understand the New Testament, what's going on? Right? So, so you've got to answer the question, this miracle working power is designed to give confirmation from God to the teaching of the apostles. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2 to 6, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Right? Now that's a good, good note for us to start. When you're dealing with unsaved people, the preaching of the gospel or what you might do in the way you talk with other people, start with this. Jesus Christ was crucified, buried and rose again. And see what, see what happens with that. Because that's the starting point. Christianity is about the following of Christ who rose from the dead and has power over life and death. And there's plenty of evidence and I can certainly send you to books that will show you all the evidence that it's even... Even non-Christian secular authors and historians say that the early church believed that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. They can't go as far as to say, so therefore he actually did, because that would start to make them Christian and they want to stay non-Christian. So they say the early apostles, disciples and believers genuinely, even unbelieving secular historians say they believed that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So that's the basis of our message. Verse 3, 1 Corinthians 2, 3. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. In other words, the weakness of his own flesh and mortality. Verse 4, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. So he didn't go down to Toastmasters and learn how to speak and then do a bit of training in a TED talk and become an eloquent speaker. What he's saying is, don't believe me a matter of fact, I'm going to determine not to come to you with eloquence. Now, we know Paul could have been eloquent if he wanted to. And that's why he said, I determined not to. I determined not to come to you with eloquence. I determined to come with you with power instead. Now, this is Paul, remember. You can't really take this to yourself. This is Paul. This is what I'm arguing that the apostles did this for a reason. And my verse four, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. Why? So that you know that following Paul and following Peter, John, James, Paul, following their teaching was not like following the scribes and the Pharisees and the philosophers of the day. They they were sort of deliberately going, I'm not going to come up with all the convoluted sort of high talking ways of, of 
getting you to agree with me. I'm going to show you the demonstration of the power of the Spirit so that you know Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And then we'll start from there because it goes on and says that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. So always be careful of convoluted interpretations. Now, that doesn't mean that a complex understanding of Scripture isn't true or shouldn't be looked at or relied upon. But remember, for us and for them, we are relying on the foundation of the apostles, which is this. The apostles performed miracles to confirm their teaching. So as they, can, they performed this miracle to confirm the teaching to the early church, so too for us. So we are looking back, relying upon their testimony. So we are looking back to their testimony saying, yes, well done. Thank you, Paul. You demonstrated that this message of the resurrection from the dead is not with convoluted worldly wisdom, but actually the demonstration of the spirit and power. So therefore, we can have confidence in what you have taught us. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, just to make sure you understand in verse 6, though, however, all right, so that's the beginning of things. So that's why it starts with the beginning of the death and resurrection and the demonstration of this power by the apostles in verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. All right, so now that you understand that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, now you understand that God has ordained this message by the miracles that we perform. Let us now teach you and give you wisdom and understanding. Yet the wisdom and teaching that they were giving is not the wisdom of this age nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. And obviously we could, I could go on from there, but just to make it clear that this doesn't mean there's no place for further teaching into maturity with wisdom, right? But we start from the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The demonstration of power to this degree is for support of the message. We, so I'm not just talking about the people back then, we can have confidence in the doctrine of the apostles because it came with such a demonstration as not seen today. And I've been around a lot and I've seen nothing that comes close to what we're about to read about these early apostles. Now, remember, this is only one of many miracles. This is one is recorded in detail. Uh, but let me just read something about them in Acts chapter 5, verse 12 to 16. Acts 5, 12 to 16. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. Now, if that's where it stopped, you could probably go. I know some traveling evangelists who have performed great miracles. I do too. But let's read on. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's perch, porch, sorry. Uh, yet none of the rest dared join them. Now, that's worth noting. Hold on. None of the rest dared join them. Well, we're not talking about the people of the world because they, why would they be interested in joining the apostles unless it's talking about none of the rest as in none of the rest of the unbelievers wanted to join the believers. But because it goes on and says, but the people esteemed them highly. And verse 12, it says, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done. So in context, remember, keep it in context, this is indicating that the rest, that means the rest of the believers, dared not try to join the apostles. Just note that a little bit. Yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Okay, and this is another reason why I can say back in 13, he's talking about Christians not thinking that they could join the apostles because in verse 14, we deal with the issue of non-believers coming to faith because it says, and believers were increasingly added. In other words, those who are unsaved became saved. Believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Joe Blow Christian, no, the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Now, now, there's no recorded evidence that his shadow actually healed, and that's not really the point of why this is here. His shadow may have healed, may not have healed. That's not really the point. The point is people know that Peter and the apostles are doing great miracles, and just like Jesus, they chased after the miracle worker 
Why? Because they wanted their life to be better. All right? Now, the sign is going to come through the apostles and then they're going to give the teaching and every apostle was martyred except for John because they simply couldn't kill him because he had to write Revelation. So even though they want the miracle worker at this point, when they start to hear the message, even that changes. Just like Jesus, they hated me, they'll hate you because I testify their deeds are evil. So even in the seeking, bringing out the sick to Peter is an evil deed in some way. Because instead of listening to the, to, the, to the message of this resurrection from the dead by Jesus Christ, yeah, yeah, we can deal with that later. Could you just heal this? Could you just raise that? Could you just do this? Like when they came to Jesus and, and he just fed them and he said, you, you come to me chasing me, looking for me, not because of the sign. In other words, you're not listening to what the miracle pointed to. You actually just want your belly filled. You just want me to produce food for you. You just want me to make your life more comfortable. And he challenged them about it and many walked away. All right, so this means that the crowd is understanding that these apostles are performing great miracles. Verse 16, also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem. Okay, now, see, if someone claims to be an apostle today that has this sort of authority, this would be happening. We wouldn't be sitting here like 50 people just quietly in someone's backyard. We'd be run over by thousands of people coming to get healed. Like I said, if you took Peter, James and John down to the town of Maryborough and they healed people and preached, the whole town is going to be turned upside down. And now I know, look, when I was younger, every young ambitious preacher dreams of that, don't they? <laughs> I'll go turn the town upside down. What do I need to do that? I'll get filled with the Holy Spirit and I'll perform miracles like Peter. So you pray for people, you pray, you pray, you fast, you do everything you can. And it doesn't happen like that. And I haven't seen it happen like that because I've mixed in some decent circles with leaders in the assemblies of God. And they hold on to the hope and they keep saying, if we just need, okay, what do we need? We need more faith. Um, we need more consecration. Uh, we need more word. We we need more of something because we're not doing what the apostles did. Okay, do you see the problem? Now, hold on, eventually you've got to sort of stop and go, especially after decades, you sort of go, hold on, something's not right here. Uh, I don't think we're that off the mark that God's not healing because we're, what, that sinful or that our doctrine is that bad or what? Why aren't, why isn't our, why aren't people laying out in the street for our shadow to heal them? Why aren't people lay, being laid out in the street for your shadow to heal them? Why? Because you and I are not the foundational apostles. This is happening so that the church is built on their teaching. Now, if you miss it, in verse 16, also a multitude gathered from surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who are tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Note that they were all healed. Now, I've been to many crusades with evangelists and I remember one guy prayed for probably 400 people and eventually somebody got healed from cancer by God's grace. And so what did they do? They put the healed cancer patient up as evidence of miraculous sign for this apostle. And I'm thinking, hold on. When these apostles prayed, they were all healed. So we had 400 sick people come to this crusade with this banner I'm thinking you have offered, and I'm getting angry because I was involved in it, you have offered to those people false hope. Why? Because you are not an apostle. Smack that in my face, Philip. All right? Wake up to yourself. I'm talking to myself back then in the AOG. You've been sold a lie, and I'm about to explain what the lie is. Now, let's consider the building of the church because that's what we're trying to look at. Lord, what should we be doing? How should we be building the church? Let's consider the building of the church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus as the chief cornerstone. So that text is in Ephesians 2.20, if you would turn there with me, Ephesians 2.20. Ephesians 2.20 to 22. Ephesians 2.20, I think Graham mentioned this when he was talking too. Ephesians 2.20, having been built, past tense, 
Now, obviously, you need to check me out. Go read more of Ephesians, the whole book of Ephesians, read Ephesians 2, investigate this for yourself. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, this is the whole church, the building of the church, the building of the body of Christ, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So if you picture the church, which is, we know the church is not, I joked about the stained glass window in the top down there. All right, we know the church is not the square. Remember the square, the thing I sent out? It's not the budgets and the staff and buildings and all that. The church is, is true believers who are born again of the Spirit into the body of Christ. You're, you're born again into Christ. That's why the expression in Christ is so important. I'm a wretched sinner saved by grace, but I'm, righteous, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. And you always got to remember that, that the, my sanctification, the holiness that I sort of experience is Christ in me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. So it's in Christ. Now, the whole building, the whole church is built on this foundation in verse 20, having been built on the foundation. So there is a foundation of the church in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Now, the Bible is clear that this foundation for the one church has been laid. You should remember the verse, 1 Corinthians 3, what was it, 10 or 11 or something we went through. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, the Bible is clear that this foundation for the one church has been laid the foundational apostles and prophets from the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Now, understand what is meant by the one church, and I think this is where people start to fall down. The one church has been established and growing for near 2,000 years. That one church is built on one foundation. See, because what happens when we read that text built on, on the foundation, and we're going to look at others if we get that far, yep, that... We do it subjectively from our experience and we then read into the text what it might mean because our church here, you could go, our church here needs to be built on the foundation of the apostles. And then you start to think, well, Peter, James and John, they died like 2,000 years ago. So we need an apostle here to build our church on. The problem with that thinking is you're not understanding what the church is because this is not the church. That's why I reckon Satan has worked hard to confuse people with the terminology, which church do you go to? I go to this church, you go to that church. So then if your mentality then becomes naturally a church needs to be built on the foundation of an apostle, you are not understanding this text because this text is not thinking like that. Shift your thinking to God's perspective. There is one body, one baptism, and it's the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church. So now from his eternal perspective, that church was started to be founded on Jesus Christ. And then we know Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, he died, rose from the dead, the chief cornerstone. The prophets are the prophets of the Old Testament, which prophesied his coming so that we could identify him. Over 400, nearly 500 prophecies that are clearly identified Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So therefore, the prophets are the foundation. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And now we're at the stage in Acts where the apostles are laying the foundation of the church. Now, this is, this is the reason that you need to get this is from God's perspective. So from God's perspective, there's only one body. Now, that's really hard for us to get our head around because that means I'm part of the same body that the 20-odd thousand believers who are now in existence because we're up to about Acts 4 and 5, those 20-odd thousand believers are part of the same body that I'm a part of. But they're dead and gone. See, because we're so natural in our thinking, we think, well, who's alive now? They're the church. Surely the dead people aren't part of the church. But from God's perspective, everybody who has lived and died with saving faith in Jesus Christ has been and is a part of his body. Because they are eternal. We go into eternal life in Christ Jesus. So there is one body from God's perspective. So people are coming in and out of that body in the natural world here with us, but they enter that one body eternally. 
I haven't got time to explain all that. But the, so they, they die and the next one comes and the next one comes. That means you look down through the millennia and you realise there has been only one church. Satan tried to come in and say there are different churches because as soon as he can get you to think there are different churches, hold on a minute, what does that mean? Is the body of Christ divided amongst itself? Are there multiple bodies? Are we one body here and another body over there? That's not what the Bible teaches. So understand what is meant by the one church, that one church has been established and growing for near 2,000 years. That one church is built on the one foundation. There are no multiple foundations down through the millennia. In 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. So we are building on another person's foundation. Because when you think locally, though, you'll think, no, I'm building this church on the foundation of my ministry. Well, no, 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 no. You might be ministering. You might be, say, as an evangelist or a church planter, as a missionary or something like that, whatever it is. You might be building a fellowship, uh, which is then part of the body, which is built on the same foundation that every other aspect of the true church is founded on, which is Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone and the apostles and the prophets. Verse 11, so when he says, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And we know that it says that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of this building, the house, the church, the body of Christ. So when you look at Ephesians 2.20 and 1 Corinthians 3.11, shows that the foundation has been laid because Ephesians 2.20 just reminds you, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In 1 Corinthians 3.11, for no other foundation. So no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. So the first thing that comes out from the chief cornerstone are the apostles and the prophets. And then it says the building is built on that foundation. Now, there is no other foundation there is no new foundation or a foundation being restored. Let me explain this. The Lord really pulled me up on this. The one foundation has always existed and the one true church has always prevailed because Christ said it would. Matthew 16, 18. If you could turn to that critical verse to understand. Matthew 16, 18. Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Let's just stop there. Uh, papal descendancy from Peter. So therefore Jesus is saying that the only true church in the world is the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, you with me? <laughs> a couple of, a couple of, no. <laughs> All right, okay, well, let's do it a different way. Let's say that Peter is an apostle and the church has to be built on apostles. So therefore, even though I don't have descended authority like the papal see, you know, God appeared to me, Jesus appeared to me and he called me an apostle. So now I have authority like Peter. So the church is built on me. You ready to go? No. Okay. Listen to what it says. I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, now remember the wording here changes in the Greek and it's not picked up well. You are Peter, Petros, like a little pebble. And on this rock, the word here for rock is bedrock. Like I've had to build on bedrock. In fact, once we had to grind it out with the grinder to get like a couple of hundred mil into it in order to fit a stairwell. Grinding and jackhammering, you go down, it's like rock. Like you could found a city on it. You can put anything on it. It's not going anywhere. So what he's saying, Peter, you're this little rock, which is like a type or a shadow of myself. But he says, on this rock, on the bedrock, I will build my church. So Jesus himself has said, I will build my church on me. I'm the chief cornerstone. Because then we've got to ask the question, how? Well, we know elsewhere that we've already looked at it by laying the foundation of the prophets and apostles. Chief cornerstone goes down because this is the analogy. It's analogy. Don't read into the analogy things you want it to say. This is what it's saying. 
the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ, goes down, built on no other foundation but Christ and him crucified. Then the first thing that gets laid out is the prophets. And in some ways you could say the prophets go first because they predict the coming of the Messiah so that we could even identify who he is. Then out the other way goes the work of the apostles. And that's what I've just argued for is that the level of miracle working power is such that everyone was healed. Now I've been in Pentecostal circles and I can tell you not everyone is healed. Some are. The gift of healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of faith, the grace of God. All right, miracles happen. Don't mishear me. But I've never seen, never watched, never heard anything like what I read about Peter, James, John and Paul. Right? The foundation of why. And I've explained why, but please get this. They did not have the New Testament. They did not have the teaching. So they had to demonstrate, don't listen to all that other rubbish you're hearing. Listen to us. We were with Jesus. And I can demonstrate it to you. Look, everybody be healed and everybody's healed. Listen to me. We have been with Jesus. So you can see why it had to happen like this. The church is then built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. But listen to this. This is the part that I've missed this before and hopefully I can communicate it well to you. Matthew 16, 18, and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, I've been in that sort of thought of restoring the church and restoration. But the Lord really pulled me up on this. So you don't think what that says is true. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Because if I think the church has to be somehow restored, therefore the church has somehow lost something, which means the gates of hell have prevailed against it. And somehow we need to get back to being restored. Now, of course, that messes with me because I look around at the church and go, are you kidding me, Lord? <laughs> yeah. that, that can't be right. That can't be sort of like your perfect bride. Like even just this week, there was a text came through a message on Facebook and Kerry wouldn't give me the phone. I really wanted to respond and write something down, but she said, no, that's my profile. Don't you dare. Because it came up, I'm an LGBTQ plus person looking for a church who will accept me in town. And all the big churches, every single one of them said, you'll be welcome with us. You'll find a home with us. You'll be welcome. And I thought, so what? I'm thinking to myself, every church just about in town and no one's understanding that this girl needs to realise that if you go to that church and they accept you, then she is going to think that God accepts her. That's the problem. So we're not saying we welcome. If somebody who's gay and lesbian or whatever else, transgender, you are welcome to come here, but I can tell you, you are not going to feel comfortable here. Why? Because you are not going to be affirmed in your sin. And so when you say we welcome you, like don't worry about who you are, what you do, we love you, we embrace you, well, God's not going to do that. So when the church sends that message, it's confusing people. I don't know how I got sidetracked with that. No other foundation. There is no new foundation. Or found, oh, that's right. It's in Matthew 16, 18. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's right. I was thinking, Lord, I'm looking at the church and thinking the gates of hell certainly look like they're prevailed against it. That's, that's just messed up in this town. No one seems to be able to actually help this woman. No one loves her enough to tell her the truth. They're all going to make her feel better. And by making her feel better, they're actually damning her to hell. Because at the moment, she probably feels a bit distressed knowing that her life is not matching up. Something's wrong. Somebody should come to her and say, yes, something is severely wrong. And there's only one way to be relieved of the trauma that you're in, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he died and rose again and has the power over life and death and has the power over your life and your death. And so therefore you need to turn from your wicked ways and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and then you will find peace. Then you will find acceptance. Different message. So I'm thinking, Lord, I'm saying to the Lord, it looks like hell has prevailed against the church. And he pulled me up and said, do you really think that? Because it says, look at it, it says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But everything I see, and then it dawned on me, <laughs> it was like, you know, when the Holy Spirit, boom, light bulb came on. That is not the church. 
And he said, so you need to come out of that because that is not my church. Hold on. <laughs> this has messed my world up because then I'm thinking, well, hold on. Okay, so I've been in corporate structure of religion in my whole life pretty much. Roman Catholic Church got saved in it, Baptist, Anglican, you name it, been all over the place. And he says, all of that is not my church. My church are true, saved, born-again believers. Why? Because look at what it says. I will build my church on the bedrock of myself. So they're doing, like what Graham was saying before, men who have a good idea, they've gone off with a good idea and done something. God, I'm sure God works in there to save people, but that's not his church. So therefore, the church of Jesus Christ has always existed since the day of Pentecost. Why? Because when you start to think about the church, you realize it is the body of Christ in the world. It is not that group or this group. It's not us here or them over there. It's not this period of history or that period of history. You realize down through the millennia since the day of Pentecost, there has been one body which Jesus has been building on himself as the chief cornerstone and that building down through that millennia is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets back in the first century. So if the one true church has never fallen to the schemes of the enemy, why would we think there needs to be a restoration of something lost? See, that's what kicked me. Because all of a sudden you go, hold on, we're not restoring something because nothing has been lost. If we start to think something has been lost from the church, then we're saying that Matthew 16, 18 is not true. We have to reinterpret it somehow to say, well, the gates of hell won't ultimately prevail against it because there'll be saints in heaven. You know, but he gives it a good blast and he manages to deceive and wreck and whatever. You know, you start twisting the scripture to make it say something else instead of going, no, the one true church, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against and Jesus is building his own church, his own body, and he is the rock of that church and the head of that church. So therefore, our mentality needs to change from this is not church. That is not church. Church is the body of Christ in the world. It has been in existence for 2,000 years and it is founded on the apostles and prophets. If the one true church has never fallen to the schemes of the enemy, why would we think there needs to be restoration of something lost? And I think that's why when you were saying these men who have given it a good go have failed because they've approached it with the idea we need to re restore something that's lost to this. And, and they're going to the thing that's not the church and trying to make it the church. And hence, they have a good intention, they have a good heart, they have a good desire, but then in the end it doesn't work. Why? Because they're not actually seeing what the church really is and they're trying to restore something that's never been lost. Instead, I see that we need to come out of corrupted false church, the antichrist system. Now, now I say that and I know I've got running out of time and there's a lot more I need to say, so I'll keep working on this. When the Reformation happened and we came out of the Roman Catholic Church, we certainly got hold of saved by grace through faith in Christ. Amen. Instead of having to pay the Roman Catholic Church or pay penance or go to confession or whatever it is they required at that time and still do require. So we got salvation by grace through faith. But we stayed in the system. Why? Because we took the system with us. What did we build? as Protestants, cathedrals, buildings, priesthood, funds, employment, money, structure. Okay, now when I think, now look, I, I'm not picking on anyone here, I'm just sharing with you what I honestly feel, that I feel that modern day apostles is another attempt of Satan to get us duped into thinking we're restoring something that's been lost. And then we'll end up trying to build in the same system that we've never gone, that system is not the church. That system is a satanic corruption and antichrist counterfeit. The one true church has always existed and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. Amen? Amen. 
So therefore, we've got to come out of our thinking about religion and Christianity and understand it so differently from God's perspective. Now, I see that we need to come out of the corrupted false church, the Antichrist system, and come into the one church that has always existed since Pentecost and has always been victorious. Now, when I say has always existed since Pentecost and been victorious, that stops us from saying we've got the edge. We've got the corner. We've got the truth. We've got the revelation. Come to us. We've figured out how the church is supposed to be built because if you're saying that, you're still stuck in the system because what you're doing is you're creating another thing that is different than the foundation that began 2,000 years ago. But when you go, hold on, it's not that structure. It's not this group. It's the body of Christ in the world, which has always been in the world since Pentecost. So therefore, it's a spiritual house, not a physical house, not a physical gathering, not a hierarchy of control. Now, we need to redefine, though, what it means to be victorious in light of that because... uh, Let me read it. The Antichrist system and come into the one true church that has always existed since Pentecost and, listen, and has always been victorious. Always been victorious. If you feel there's something that needs to be restored, then you need to come out of whatever you think needs to be restored because that's not the church. So, but we have to then redefine what victory means. But we, <laughs> I'm thinking of a church name, uh, but we need to redefine victorious in light of the many false ideas about the church under the papal system of corporate institutional religion. Now, you've heard me talk about corporate institutional religion, and hopefully you understand what I mean by that. But now what I'm saying is that corporate institution of religion is no different than the papal see of the Roman Catholic Church. And that victory then is coming out of that false system, the the church has always been victorious. Jesus Christ said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my body in the world. He will build his church on his bedrock of himself and he will add to it those who are saved and he is the head of that. And that church has never succumbed to Satan and his temptation. We have. You know that by by all the splits and the divisions and the fights and everything else that goes on. We have, but the body hasn't. So then we've got to think the church is not what I've known it to be. I need to re-understand this. So that means in our text in Acts chapter 3, we see that Peter understood that the foundation of the prophets had been fulfilled in Christ. I'm running out of time, but let me just do a few. Acts chapter 3 verse 24. Acts chapter 3, verse 24. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. And if you go back and have a bigger look at his sermon in Acts 3, you'll understand that is the context what he's saying. Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone whom you rejected, all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, have spoken and foretold of these days. So therefore, Jesus is the chief cornerstone and the foundation of the prophets. So therefore, Peter understood it this way. So with great power, we see that the apostles confirmed the divine nature of their teaching, which was then written down and becomes the foundational doctrine of the church. So as the early church committed itself to the doctrine of the apostles, so should we. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's all I'm going to stop on today. The fellowship, breaking of bread, you know, God willing, we'll get to those things. We are to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, but we need to be clear the foundation of the apostles is the apostles' first given. Paul, James, Peter, John. Why? Because now you understand that there's been one church, one body that is founded at the beginning on one foundation, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, the apostles and the prophets. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 makes more sense to me now. And remember how I've said before, when you start to get the right understanding, scriptures that haven't quite been clear don't make sense, start to make sense. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles. Yes, 
Because when you think of the church as the body of Christ in the world for 2,000 years, what came first? The apostles. They laid the foundation. Why? Because they were the ones who were with Jesus. They were the ones who then performed the miracles and healed everybody to say, listen to us, this is the doctrine. And eventually that was written down into what we now understand to be the New Testament. So the New Testament to me is the doctrine of the apostles, the founding apostles. And if we start to get beyond that, we're going to get into men who come up with all strange ideas. So these first apostles have been given. Now, some will claim that Jesus had to give apostles, sorry, some will claim that Jesus had to give apostles from his ascended position in heaven, meaning that he does so today. Now, this is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, and it's already one hour up, so I'm going to have to pick it up from here. But for a bit of pre-reading to help me unpack that with you and explain in light of what I've said, how do I then interpret Ephesians 4, verse 7 to 13? So if you could spend some time through the week doing that and even discussing that a little bit in your home groups, um, in light of what Philip said, you know, do you believe that the body of Christ is that one church that has existed? Do you believe that the foundational apostles and prophets is the foundation of the church from the chief cornerstone? Then in Ephesians 4, 8, where it says, therefore, he says, when he ascended on high and then from that ascended position, he gave gifts to men, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all come to the unity of the faith. All right, so till we all come to the unity of the faith, all right, I need to unpack this. I can't do this now. All right, but if you ever read it on that, think about that, and I'll pick it up from there next time because I need to now explain and interpret this from the perspective that I've just shared with you. Let me summarise. Lord, where are we at? We're thinking of a way forward. We've come out of corporate institutional religion, but I see a lot of baggage. <laughs> I see a lot of baggage around me and I see a lot of baggage with me. It's going to take time for us to really nut out what does this mean to live as the body of Christ in the world and get free of that papal system of churchianity or denominationalism, as some people call it. You know, because if we start to have the mindset, this is our church, we've already bought, the, we've already taken the bait, Satan's bait. As soon as we do that, taking Satan's bait. So that's my difficulty is the language, because I talk to people and say, what church do you go to? Um, and I don't want to give them a lecture. I can't go to church because Jesus Christ's body is the church in the world. And that has existed for, oh, no, mate, I just wanted to know where do you go to church, you know? Do you see what I mean? It's difficult, isn't it? So we're going to have to navigate this in terms of our relationship with each other because we're all going to be on different places with this. You know, some of us are further down that path and really happy to just abandon that corporate religion, but others are going to find it quite difficult. So we need to journey together. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for your word to us. And I pray, Lord, that as we keep seeking you and searching this out, that you'll give us illumination of your truth and understanding of your word. And we do thank you for Peter and James and John and Paul and the others who performed such miracles that we can have confidence in their teaching. Lord, that we can look back and say with confidence, you are the resurrected Christ and our hope is sure to the glory of your name. Amen.